This will be my seventh season going in. Uh, and one of my jobs when I first started was to uh, watch the weather during the, the early part of the spring season and determine whether or not it had started raining before the sun came up and kept going. And then if it had, I had to go out to the orchard, grab a slide from our spore fan trap, and rush back to the lab, so much so that I actually almost got a speeding ticket one time, <laughs> uh, to count the spores and determine whether or not that rain had actually been an infection event. So as I started watching these events come and go, as I'm sure you all have seen as well with the weather, it was just so variable that I started to wonder whether or not this was affecting the output of our decision support systems and the models in them. So I started to look at these systems. Um, I was looking at the user interface, basically what you all see when you log on to your system and try to determine whether or not there's risk of infection or a pest outbreak. I looked at this as it relates to Apple Scab. Um, and so I was looking at the Ascospore maturity component to it and the infection period model as well. So there's four decision support systems that we had for, available for us in the Northeast. We had AgRadar, which is um, run and uh, maintained at UMaine by Glenn Kaler. Uh, this particular decision support system uses virtual weather data to fuel the models. Um, and while you could access the sites for free, if you wanted a site-specific link for your orchard, you would have to pay for the weather data to be there. So basically, your neighbor could access your link, um, but you had to pay for the data. Uh, NUA, uh, the Network for Environment Weather Applications out of Cornell, I'm sure you all are familiar with this. Um, this particular decision support system uses um, automated weather stations as its weather source. Uh, again, it's free to access. Uh, there are more weather stations in this system than you find in a lot of others. Um, but if you have a station on site, you of course will have to pay for that yourself. And NUA does charge a fee to access that data. So if you, again, have your system online, your neighbor could access it without having to pay anything for it. In Massachusetts, we actually have a, um, a network for the whole entire state, and so we pay that NUA fee. If you were to do that as an individual, it's about $350. RIMPRO is out of the Netherlands. Uh, this is a uh, privately owned decision support system. You do have to pay for the entire access to the system. Um, and they use either automated weather stations or you can use virtual data for this. Uh, and then the final one is Skybit. This was operated by ZX. Uh, they use their own proprietary uh, weather data. This data was also used by AgRadar. A couple of years ago, BASF bought ZX. They ran Skybit for another year, shut it down, shuttered it. Uh, so we lost AgRadar as well. However, I've been talking with Glenn Kaler, and he assures me that he has got a fix for this problem, that we'll be back online for this growing season, uh, we just don't have a date yet. So, I'm going to spend a little time going into the background of kind of the inner workings of a decision support system, and I'm going to talk about it within the framework of SCAB. Uh, it's an easy thing for us all to get uh, a handle on, because we just deal with it all the time. So I am going to go over the life cycle real quick. Um, obviously, over winters in this, uh, with the leaves on the floor, orchard floor, in the spring, rains, ascospores are mature and ejected. They cause infection, which can cause more infection. Going throughout the whole season, starts over again. And then we really want to focus on stopping these, um, these primary infections. And that's really where your decision support system comes in. And that's why the models that are in this decision support system are important. So the first of those models, it's the Mills table. We are all, I'm sure, familiar with the Mills table. Um, what this model did, um, Mills had put this out during uh, the 1940, 1944 War Bulletin. His actual initial intent was to reduce sulfur use because that was a, a critical material for the um, war effort overseas. So his goal was to help apple growers really fine tune their application uh, and reduce their use of sulfur for apple scab. So what he did was said, you know, given that you have inoculum in the orchard, you have a certain duration of leaf wetness and a certain temperature, you're going to have infection. And he would he sort of elucidated how severe that infection would be based on temperature and leaf wetness. So for example, uh, at 70 degrees, about 18 hours of leaf wetness would give you a severe infection. Uh, the next part of this, the second model that goes into this, is that ascospore maturity model. Because remember, Mills said you had to have inoculum in the first place. So this one tells us when that inoculum becomes available, 
when the bulk of the inoculum is going to be present and as the final end of it. So that's the beginning and the end of our season for infection. Um, so McCarty and Gadori developed this in New Hampshire about 1982. They actually originally started using silver tip as their biofix, so they would accumulate degree days starting at silver tip, and they sort of refined that and decided that green tip was actually better and easier to quantify when you're looking at your orchard. Um, so he used degree days, and uh, it was just the mathematical accumulation of those uh, heat units to drive this model. <coughs> but what that doesn't take into effect or into account is the fact that um, extended dry periods have a significant impact on the development of ascospores in this primary growing season. So what happens is that if we don't get rain for five, six, seven days, those ascospores stop maturing completely. And in effect, what this does is this elongates our primary infection potential. So if we didn't account for this dry time in our uh, models, we could potentially be calling an end to our primary ascospore um, availability before it's done, which means that we do have additional infection potential that we haven't really accounted for. So we call this the dry switch. So the dry switch itself is just a mechanism in the, the model and it flips off um, after a certain amount of time has gone by and then once it rains again, it flips back on and accumulation begins for those heat units for ascospore maturity again. So all of that, goes into this decision support system. So you've got that outward facing piece and in the background you've got your site specific weather data that feeds into your ascospore maturity model. Remember this is based on your biofix, your degree day accumulation, and your precipitation. That feeds into your infection model because again Mills said you had to have inoculum in your orchard in order to have an infection which uses temperature, leaf wetness, and inoculum and that at the end of the day gives your daily infection potential. And then of course depending on what type of the season we have here, you get the dry switch coming in or going out. So, we've talked all about the whole biological component to this, but the other sort of mystery in this decision support system aspect is the weather. So we have automated weather stations, those are our physical stations on site. Uh, and this is kind of what we consider to be the ground truth, um, as best as it can, can be measured. Um, there are some challenges with this, not least of which are the financial output to get this established in your orchard to begin with. Right now, we're running about $1,400 to get a new baseline station that has the bare minimum of the sensors that you need, uh, which is great when you think in 2001 it was about $4,000, uh, but you can spend up to $2,000. Actually, we just put in a, um, a new weather station at our agronomy farm <laughs> because the, the building actually was hit by lightning and that fried the entire system that the weather station fed its data into and so we weren't able to fix that at that point. So got a new station, $2,000. So there's the initial cost there. And then you have the other issues that come along with the weather station like regular maintenance. Um, you know, theoretically you should maintain your station on site, uh, but what happens in reality more for Massachusetts is that John Clements, my colleague, uh, runs around like a madman in the spring and makes sure all of the weather stations are online, all of the sensors are working, um, and the data is actually reporting appropriately. You're not saying you've gotten three inches of rain when it's actually been dry for a week. Um, and of course there's the day-to-day the -day maintenance, like, you know, did a bird drop on the leaf wetness sensor, or did a wasp build its nest in your rain gauge. All of these things are actually things that we have encountered and they can really foul the weather data going in. And then of course there's the network piece as well. So virtual data is, uh, is, is actually really useful for folks who can't or don't want to deal with a weather station. It's good data. Um, the internet, it can be an issue, but what it does is it basically takes the satellites, it takes historical weather data, and it takes your weather stations, and it takes all of that information, and it gives you a, um, what we call past cast. Uh, so this is your historical weather data for your site, and all of this is able to feed into the decision support systems the same way that the weather station does without the trouble of maintaining the weather station. Um, there's different levels of re resolution you can achieve, which is what these three images are showing you. Um, the higher up the resolution is, the larger the grid, the less um, fine the data is. And so what we're, they've been doing is working really hard to um, increase the resolution and get it down to, at this point, it's even better actually than a one kilometer grid. So the resolution is really tight with this new uh, virtual weather data. So you get good point specific weather data for your site. 
So that's all the stuff that goes into the historical end of the decision support system. We still want to know what's about to happen, right? When is the next scab event coming? So we need our forecast for that. Um, we got two sources for that forecast. We have NOAA, which is our um, National Weather Service data. Um, and then that's what NUA and um, AgRadar, I believe, are using. And then for RIMPRO, because it's a European um, company, they don't actually have access to NOAA. They haven't built that relationship yet. So what they have is what they call YR.NO. It's a Norwegian Meteorological Society uh, in combination with the uh, Norwegian Broadcasting Company. And basically, they built their um, forecasting system off of the paradigm of NOAA. So it's very much the same. It's just based out of Europe. All right. So each of these decision support systems has a different way of looking at things, um, as do we all. So I, it was interesting to me to see how they represented it and how it worked in application in a day-to-day -day use. So this is a quick snapshot of RIMPRO. I'll go into this all in a little bit of detail in a minute. Um, this is what AgRadar does. They both have similar um, outputs in that they show you bars um, when there's an infection coming. NUA, um, green good, red bad. And then this was Skybit. This was sent into your mailbox every day, or your email every day, and it was just this table of um, dates and pluses for infection potential and minuses for no infection potential. Um, so I'm going to start with AgRadar because we are going to have that back online again soon. Um, so I, um, we're all really busy. So for me, it's really important to be able to access the data that we need when we need it without having to go through a bunch of different layers. So what I was looking at kind of was like, all right, how many clicks do I have to go through to get to what I want? So here's one. We're landing on our, we're on the home page, right? From here, we're going to pick our state. And from then, we're going to, from there, we're going to pick our site. So we get into this, and so this is a real big, ugly screenshot, but what this is is showing you is that these are not even all of the things that AgRadar actually has available to look at. But so you can see this, um, this arrow here is pointing to the thing that I really wanted to key in on. This is actually what I find to be the most useful scab output from AgRadar, and it's that graph that I had showed you before. So each of these bars represents a potential infection event. The higher the bar, the more significant the event is in terms of in season. So earlier in the season, I'm not sure if you can see these here, these little blips, not a significant infection event at this point. Now you get in a little bit later, and here you're looking at this is about 20% of your total ASCO spore um, bank. Uh, that's a, a lot of ASCO spores, that's a lot of infection. And it's later into the season, which means you've got more target area to hit. And then here you can see two significant bumps, and those are back to back. So of course that's a um, that's a combined event. That's a two day event there. So that's a pretty good amount of information in one graphic. And of course he's got the textual components down to below that you can read into more detail if you like. So RIMPRO sort of has something similar to that, and then it adds an awful lot more information to that. So what we see here is we've got all of our three different models represented here visually. At the bottom of the line, you see those blue, dark, light blue. You've got the dark blue for your rain. You've got the light blue for your leaf wetness. So this basically gives you that information on how long the leaves are going to be wet and how long they're going to be susceptible for, to infection. You go up to that next bar there where you see the dark red and the light red. The dark red represents a um, bank of 10,000 potential spores. And this is what will mature and deplete over the season. So he's given you a visual representation of what is potential for your infection in the orchard. You go to that next larger box up, and again, you see some more red lines. Much like you saw with AgRadar, those red lines represent infection potential. The higher up the red line is, the more significant the event is going to be. Um, there's some other detail in there, but really that red line is what you're looking at for your infection potential, and that's what you're going to worry about. If it's a small little blip of a red line, again, like with AgRadar, not something you're necessarily going to worry about. When you see ones that come up here, you're paying attention. So that's a lot of information, but it's all of the information that you need to make an effective decision during primary scab season. <coughs> so, so far, AgRadar and RimPro had three or four clicks to get to what we needed. So now we're coming into NUA, and again, this is the home page. From here, you're going to go to your... Um, Pest forecast drop down. You're going to pick your grouping of pests, diseases, insects. We're going to go with diseases today. And then we get to this page. You've got to pick your um, which disease you want to look at. You have to pick your state. 
then you have to pick your site that you're looking at within that state. Um, the nice thing about this is it does cache that information now, so when you go in there, you don't have to redo this all the time. That was really frustrating when you had to do that. Um, so then you go and you have your day ready, and then you go ahead and click calculate. So even still, we're now at about six clicks. And now finally, we get to our output. What I think is interesting about this is that red and green, your eyes seem to be really, mine anyway, are really drawn to that red and green. So I'm looking directly at that, and that's a simple output. It's a binary um, explanation of what's coming on, but I don't feel like Apple Scab is really uh, a black or white situation. Uh, you can look at other information here. They've got sport information here. You've got your weather data down here. Um, and then, of course, you can look into this aspect for maturity graph. And the thing that is important to remember with NIWA, they'll estimate your green tip date. You have to put in your own green tip date because their estimation is not going to be accurate. They even say this themselves. That's not me being mean. <laughs> um, so you really need to make sure that you put in your own green tip date. And again, that will cache that information for the season. Here, there's, this is that uh, ASCOS bar maturity graph. This also has other weather, weather data involved in this. Um, and then if you ever want to look at your whole scab season at one glance, unfortunately, this is what NUA gives you. Um, it's every single infection event that was estimated by the system, even the ones that occurred before you fixed the green tip date. So when you had your false green tip date in, you would have had an infection event estimated, they hang on to that. And so when you go to look at this, they're still showing you that information. So how many clicks does it really take to get to the center of what you're looking for? I am not a patient person. I want to know what I want to know, and I want to know it now. So that's a real uh, limitation potentially for a decision support system and something that needs to be worked on on some of them. Hopefully all of you got that reference. <laughs> uh, all right, so that was the user interface part. Um, so next I looked at the actual accuracy of these models within the decision support systems as they compared to um, what we saw in the lab and what we saw in the field. Um, so we had nine site year combinations, which we, okay, so in 2016, I was using Amherst and Belchertown, and then in 2000, or rather, Belchertown and Deerfield, and then in 2017, I added Amherst, and then in 2018, I added a site in Connecticut. So all of the, those um, sites and years got lumped together to use these analyses. So first, I looked at ASCO's poor maturity. Um, so this is actually, as you can see by the picture in the middle there, uh, it's like the academic version of waterboarding. <laughs> and we always hire undergraduates to do it because it is a time-consuming and tedious process, and this is why we really want our decision support systems to work for us. Um, so what we do is we put leaves out in the fall, they overwinter on site, these are infected leaves. In the spring, when we um, expect that scab will start coming um, <coughs> available, we go out and start collecting these leaves, and we start looking for the first spore. Uh, then once we get that first spore, we continue to do this on a weekly basis throughout the growing season until we are no longer seeing any spore. Um, so what you see here is a close-up of a leaf. You can see that little black dot there. That's what the spore is coming out of. So then we count lots of spores, and here's what we get. So first thing we're looking at here is how the uh, petri plate assay that I just described to you lines up with what the decision support systems were estimating um, for our first available ASCO score. Remember, the first available ASCO score is an indication of when we are going to be looking at infection potential. There was no significant difference between our first observed spore and that estimated by any of the decision support systems. Great. So then I went and looked at the decision support systems and compared them to each other because that model output was different. Um, and so what we saw was that Skybit and NUA were different and Skybit, Repro, and Ag Radar were, di were different. For some reason, Skybit, in spite of using the same biofix, didn't estimate spore to be available until it was about two weeks after um, that biofix. And so that's why Skybit is different. For some reason, they just started ASCO spore estimations uh, later. So those are our first spore. So when we start to look at our final spore, things start to get a little more interesting because this is when we're thinking, all right, we're done with primary scab, uh, I'm moving on to think about summer disease, whatever. But what we saw was that things, the decision support systems were different from what we saw in the Petri plate assay, and all of the decision support systems except RIMPRO estimated an end to ASCO score maturity prior to what we saw in the Petri plate assays. RIMPRO estimated those ASCO spores to be available longer than the Petri plate assay. 
So when compared to each other, the only ones that weren't different were Skybit and AgRadar. Um, so NUA estimated their final score to be available and spent prior to AgRadar, RIMPRO, and Skybit. RIMPRO, again, estimated their score to be available longer than the other decision support systems. So that was the ESCO-SPORE maturity component. That's telling us when we have the potential for infection, but we want to know when are we actually getting our first infection, because two or three spore might not be all that important when we're just barely at green tip. Um, so again, we had this bank of uh, leaves out in the orchards, and what we were doing was putting um, trap trees into the hoop house, which you can see here, uh, and getting them moving a little bit ahead of the orchard so that there was a little bit more tissue because we wanted to really um, kind of have more of a conservative estimate of what was going on and catch that first infection event when the spore, there were enough spore available. Uh, so this is that you see here, the trap trees were further along. Now as the season progressed, the trap trees and the orchard evened out. So we didn't have um, ontogenic resistance or the, the leaves cuticle didn't get so thick that it couldn't become infected. Uh, I find that a small child helps all experiments go better. <laughs> so <laughs> my daughter uh, was helping me this one day put out the trap trees. These trap trees were put out before an expected event, um, an, an expected event. Uh, the rain would happen. We'd wait for the leaves to dry. We'd go collect the trees, put them back in the hoop house. At this point, my daughter is in school and not helping me with the trees. <laughs> um, and then we'd, we'd wait for the, uh, and then, so they'd go back into the hoop house and then the new trees would go out before the next event. So for each new potential event, we have a new set of trees to get exposed to uh, infection. So they sit in the hoop house, they get protected from any further rain event so that there's no chance of um, additional infection occurring. And then we just wait for the sport or the lesions to show up. And that's how we determine whether or not there's an infection event. So, when we compared our decision support systems to our trap trees for the first event that occurred, they were all significantly different. The trap trees did not show infection until after each decision support system estimated that there was. So what this, saying, this is saying is that these decision support systems are um, saying that there's infections occurring when we don't actually have enough spore available. Now remember, these trees were actually further along, so they should have been more susceptible than the orchard trees. So these, these trap trees are showing that these early infections that are being estimated by the decision support systems are not necessarily actually infection events. We compared the um, decision support systems to each other again. Um, NUA was different than RIMPRO. Uh, NUA actually estimated a infection event prior to the first estimated by RIMPRO, um, and likewise for Skybit, prior to Skybit. Um, okay. So this was our final infection event. Uh, so again, trap trees first compared to the decision support systems. The only one that was significantly different here was RIMPRO. Again, RIMPRO is going a little bit later into the season, giving you a more conservative estimation of when you have infection potential. And then compared to each other, um, the only, the big difference here, of course, is that RIMPRO is going to go longer. Um, than all of the others. RIMPRO goes longer than NUA, AgRadar, and sooner than RIMPRO, Skybit, and sooner than RIMPRO, and AgRadar actually called the final infection event prior to Skybit. Okay, so that's a pretty in-depth comparison of all of these different decision support systems and what we're seeing out in the field and the lab as it relates to AppleScab. AppleScab is not actually the only game, believe it or not. <laughs> so these decision support systems have a number of other uh, tools available for you to use. So for example, AgRadar um, has this handy little uh, calendar of events. And what it does is it breaks down, you know, for example, what should I be doing before my trees break uh, dormancy? And it tells you, well, you know, you better make sure your filters are clean and your nozzles are calibrated. Uh, you know, and it goes into dormant sprays and goes out through a whole entire season and lays out the tasks that are really important to remember to accomplish that can be forgotten in the rush of everything else that's going on. <laughs> the other thing that AgRadar has, which is really great and ties into what Anna was talking about earlier, is this honeybee activity chart. So the orange bars indicate when the honeybees are moving around, and then you see that wavy purple line, that's your wind speed. 
So what you're looking at is not only an opportunity to avoid honeybees based on their activity, but to find your key time to make your spray applications because obviously when it's windy, it's not a good time to be spraying. So we could spend an awful lot of time going over all of the bits and pieces that are folded into this decision support system. Um, however, you might come at me with pitchforks and torches. So I'm just gonna really quickly cover that we've got six different diseases that we have a potential to have a model for um, and which decision support has them. So as you can see, uh, RIMPRO has the most decision support system models available for you. Uh, interesting here, uh, Terry mentioned Marcinina, so I'm going to take a quick second to talk about Mar Marcinina. It's showing up more and more in our orchards in Massachusetts. I don't know how you all are seeing this as well. Uh, currently, it's showing up in commercial orchards, however, it does not yet appear to be causing um, any uh, damage to the crop. It defoliates trees when it's unsprayed. And it's concerning because we're seeing more of it and we're not really sure yet what is effective against it except for Manzi. But it's not labeled for Marcinina. So we do have a model for Marcinina available. And the, the, the canker, we are lucky enough to not have an issue with apple canker so much. We do see the um, Nectria shoot in twig blight. Uh, even more insect pests available. Um, here you see that actually uh, the reverse is true. AgRadar has more of the insect pest models that we need to look at than RIMPRO does. Um, and NUA has a fair number of them, but there's a little bit more. There's other models available too. So we've got stone fruit models that you can use. We have vegetable models for those folks who have veggies. Um, and we have uh, obviously weather archives and there is um, horticultural models like the thinning models that come in handy. Okay, so first of all, I want to say that um, the website for the uh, different systems that I uh, talked about is are written out here. I don't have a handy little link like Anna did yet, but maybe I'll send those to Terry. Oh, I'll be online. Yeah. I'm working on that. Oh, great. <laughs> so, uh, but, you know, the real, the real takeaway for this is that these decision support systems are chock full of tools for you to use, but at the end of the day, communication between extension, between growers, between these decision support systems is really the best way to effectively use these tools in your IPM imp implementation programming. Uh, and also, the better the information is in these decision support systems, the better they are for you. So. Thank you for your time. Um, huge thanks to the growers who let me bring infected apple leaves into their orchards. Uh, that's pretty brave. <laughs> and also to the students um, who helped uh, get some of these spore counted and to John Clements and Dan Cooley for helping me along with this. Questions? Okay. Back up on here, Dr. Anna 